I hope it stops her practice. Check the weather out. Have a good day. Thanks, you too. We'll do it. Small group discussion there, this is a lot of sometimes.
All right, good morning and welcome back. As we're getting started today, um, if you have a device with you and you haven't done so already, I'm asking you to just take a moment to work on the presentation availability form that's on the front page of Canvas. Um, if you don't have a device with you or you're still um, waiting to figure out what your schedule might look like for athletics, travel, and other things, that's okay. Um, just make sure that you have completed that um, by Friday at the latest. So if you go on the front page of Canvas for this course, you'll see that there is the presentation availability form. It asks you to list your name and it asks you to list the dates that you're able or not able to attend. Um, the reason we're doing this is um, as we start to get into the later weeks of the term, uh, people will be giving presentations um, related to a theory from that day. Um, and I wanna make sure that that schedule is um, in line with any travel restrictions like athletics, uh, extracurriculars, performance arts, or anything else that you have that might conflict with the class meeting. And then after this week, uh, once I've received them, I will get people uh, scheduled into the presentation days.
there anybody who is uh, working on the form right now who still needs to do that? Great. So again, as a reminder, just make sure to get that in by Friday. And then after Friday's class, I will go ahead and uh, share uh, the list of presentation dates. Remember that on the presentation, right, it's just a short uh, opportunity for you to share an article that you found that relates to the theory that we are covering for that day. So for example, if you were assigned to today, uncertainty reduction theory, you would select um, a, an outside journal article, perhaps um, something you acquired from JSTOR or the EOU library, right? And um, share a little bit about how this outside article uses the assigned theory. So um, again, this is not asking you to explain this theory to the class. Um, that'll be my job. Uh, but um, on your end, you'll be explaining how this outside article is adding to our understanding of the theory. And don't be worried. This is not like a um, you know, public speaking formal presentation where you're going to be graded on your public speaking ability and looking at your ability to be prepared, uh, to have things that you're ready to share with us, uh, but um, it's much more about bringing in that content. So uh, thank you for working on that. And again, I look forward to um, hearing from the presentation soon. Okay, so as a quick recap of last class, took some time to talk about theory reflection, and we also took some time to go over the very first theory um, of many that we'll be covering in the class. Again, each class from here on out, we're going to be looking at a very different theory um, that comes from a variety of different places in communication, adopts a variety of styles, right? Again, uh, think about it as putting on a different pair of glasses each day, right? Each day we come into a class, we look at a new theory, and we look at some of the assumptions and beliefs and ideas that this theory is bringing to the table. You might like it, you might not, um, but our goal is to play around with these theories and understand them a little bit better. So um, we explored symbolic interaction theories. You might recall we used the example of the uh, Disney Pixar film Inside Out to show us how the embodiment of emotions can be a way of using symbols to convey reality and human experience. We experience sadness, joy, and fear, um, but the ability to portray them um, on screen is a way of bringing to light uh, human experiences through the use of symbols to convey shared reality. A core idea of SIT is blank. It's the first stable belief we have about ourselves. It's not a graded quiz or anything like that, but just a chance for us to review. Is there anybody who is um, confident about or wants to take a stab at what this blank is? What are the fairly stable beliefs we hold about ourselves according to this theory? Yes, it is awesome. Um, so uh, great response, right? So self-concept is generally how we feel about ourselves. Are, am I an introverted or extroverted person? Am I good or am I a bad person, right? Am I selfless or selfish, right? Those are things that we believe about ourselves to be true. And what we come to understand about who we are is something that we develop through the process of communication using symbols to communicate with one another. Great response. Um, so just as a reminder, the theory reflection assignment is due Sunday, April 23rd. Um, again, um, I'm happy to look over rough drafts or outlines. Um, we'll be going over uncertainty reduction theory, which is an example of the types of theories that you could explore for this assignment. Right, so the theories that we go over this week and next week are all fair game for this assignment. This is just a short response that's asking you to talk about how um, the theory that you've chosen is relevant to your own life experiences. So you might talk about how the symbols that you use to develop your sense of self-concept connect to symbolic interaction. We'll talk a lot about uncertainty reduction today, which is a really good theory for understanding um, some of the ways that we form connections with other people. Um, so also, if you're running into any issues with accessing the textbook um, for the second week's readings, please let me know, and I'm happy to try to help you out. Otherwise, make sure that you're getting a copy of the book for this week's quiz. Okay, so for today, um, I want to take some time to explore uncertainty reduction theory, and in particular, how it applies to our relationships and use of social media. But um, rather than start by talking at you about these things, um, what I would like you to do is to take some time to find somebody in the class that you don't already know. Um, so this might be somebody that um, is sitting somewhere else in the room, somebody you didn't walk in with or sit next to. And what I want you to do is just to take a few minutes to share and get to know each other better. 
Um, in addition to your names, you might share a few things like what brought you to EOU, some of the classes that you're taking, some activities that you like to do on campus, um, some of your hobbies and things you like to do outside of campus. Um, so, you know, the sky's the limit. It's a chance for you to get to know somebody else. Uh, you don't need to take formal notes, although I do recommend that you maybe remember and recall some of the things that you've heard from this partner. You can also form a group of three or smaller groups if you would like as well. So, um, break, take some time to um, find somebody else and get to chatting with them. I don't have one on Thank 
Glad to hear such good conversation, lively conversation. I'm really glad to see folks uh, getting to know each other better. We'll continue to do that as uh, we continue with the term. So as you're returning to your own seats and um, getting back to your notes, um, part one of attendance will ask you to do today. So hang on to this because I'll ask you to do part two in a little bit is to think about this experience. First of all, what was it like to talk to somebody that you didn't know very well? And second of all, if you're thinking about the communication that you did, the way that you expressed yourself both verbally and non-verbally to this other person, what stood out to you? What did you notice about how you and the other person communicated? Maybe it was the topics, maybe it was the way that you engaged with that person. Um, what were some things that really came to mind? So we'll give you some time to think about, reflect, and uh, write or type some of your thoughts on this process. We'll give you another minute or two to reflect on your thoughts for this conversation.
Go ahead and finish your current thought or idea. So um, as I was going around and hearing some of you share, right, one of the things that we oftentimes do, we don't know people very well, right, is oftentimes we'll start by asking a lot of introductory information. So a lot of the questions, like your name, your major, what you're doing in and out of the EOU, right, those are things that you oftentimes use to start the process of questioning and to start to convey openness. So you might do like a back and forth, what do you do? Uh, what do you do, right? So there's very much a kind of, uh, seesaw between the two sides. Um, another thing that I kind of noticed was a lot of people would kind of move, um, kind of to be closer, to show good engagement um, and eye contact. But, uh, you know, there's differences between how you're communicating with somebody else in the class versus how you're communicating with a close friend or family member. You're not like walking up and giving somebody a hug or shaking their hand or high-fiving them, right? Because you don't really know them. So, um, as you're thinking about this process of communicating to somebody that, you know, it's pretty new, maybe you've seen them in a class or two before, but um, you haven't had the chance to get to know all that well yet, that process of how you initiated communication is really closely connected to today's theory, uncertainty reduction theory. So uncertainty reduction theory, right, is about how we deal with ambiguity and uncertainty in our everyday life and in our human relationships, right? Because we're always placed in situations where we're getting to know and meeting people for the first time. We're sharing our names, we're sharing information, um, and oftentimes there's a lot of anxiety over that. You go to a party or a social event, you first join a team or club, you don't really know the people there, right? You feel really out of your element. So you're starting to feel more comfortable over time. So um, the idea here is that we use communication as a means of reducing that uncertainty and ambiguity. How do you form close friendships with other people? Well, you've spent time with them, right? You have formed closer relationships. You've had conversations. Um, I spent a number of years coaching speech and debate. We'd always have a lot of new people on the team. And one of the best ways that we got to get to know each other better is when we would do these like very long drives out to tournaments and competitions because people were stuck in a car together for several hours. They had to communicate. They had to talk. They had to get to know each other. Sometimes people would DJ and play music that they liked, and that was the way we got to get to know each other, too. So we use communication to feel more comfortable with each other, right? In other words, uncertainty is challenging, right? Dealing with stranger danger, dealing with fear that the person that we're talking to is not somebody that we trust or fully understand, that can be difficult. So um, communication is the means by which we can get rid of that. How many people are familiar with the term catfishing? Okay, just about all of you, right? Um, right, so catfishing, as you might know, is the idea that uh, somebody will portray a false identity online. Uh, there was a famous football player, uh, who's Monte Teo, right, who um, like had somebody that he would like in a serious relationship with, like was even like, I guess, maybe engaged, uh, at least virtually with, and turned out that person was not at all who they said they were, right? Um, people will oftentimes, things like dating and social media, uh, portray um, perhaps a different gender identity, um, use images that are from somebody completely different, right? So online, there's a lot of anxiety um, over like fake accounts, bot accounts, AI accounts, um, sometimes you get like weird texts that are automated and are scams that are trying to be uh, phishing schemes. Um, so one of the challenges that we face, including in online settings, is figuring out if we can trust and really know that the person we're talking to is who they say they are, right? So it's an example here of how we use uncertainty reduction, um, both face-to-face -face and online. So this takes a social and psychological perspective. Right, this is the idea here of how we're understanding our relationships, how they impact human cognition. It's intra and interpersonal. Um, we experience uncertainty intrapersonally in our own head. Oh, geez, I don't know this person that I'm going to be talking to. I don't know this team. What am I going to do? We experience uncertainty reduction theory interpersonally. You'll notice this as you were talking to other people, you were sharing, and perhaps toward the end of the conversation, feeling more comfortable. And then this is a more positivistic and empirical approach. This is an approach that is a lot more based on kind of generating scientific information, information that can be hard coded and transferred. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about how uh, this theory uses that information. By the way, um, if you've taken a class like interpersonal communication with me, probably heard about this theory before. Uh, there's a little bit of overlap, especially early on, but 
you know, that's what we do. Um, but there's also going to be, you know, a lot of new ideas here and a lot of theories that you're not familiar with. Here. So you've noticed that these theories are from another class too. Um, this is a chance for us to dig into them a little bit deeper and um, kind of fits within the broader survey of what we're studying. So um, again, every theory brings about an assumption, right? If you put on the glasses, what do the lenses look like? Um, how is this theory suggesting that we look at the world? Well, people experience uncertainty in communication that creates stress, right? Stranger danger, anxiety. Uh, we feel uncomfortable if we don't really know the people that we're talking to that well. Are they a safe person? Are they a trustworthy person? Who, um, is this a person that I value, right? Those are concerns that we feel early on. When strangers meet, we do what we can to reduce uncertainty, right? So you've got to know somebody's name. You've got to learn a little bit about some of the activities that they do. A lot of you start by bringing up some of the things that you do at EOU, right? That means that over time, you're feeling less uncertainty with that person. In other words, as human beings, like we like patterns. We like predictability and we like routine, uh, in particular with regard to our social relationships. Oftentimes, if we're settling into a new routine, like at a new job, or a new schedule, right? We start to feel a little bit uncertain early on what this is going to look like, but we fall into a pattern that feels comfortable. Last year, I had a coworker who uh, was in the room right across from me, and he was incredibly talkative, incredibly extroverted and open, right? And at first, I was like, oh no, I'm in my office, I'm trying to grade, I'm trying to work, right? Uh, but I came to realize that, you know, just about every day he's going to be coming by and having a long conversation with me. So I started to block out time in my schedule to make sure that I was free when he wanted to talk to me and I had a much better experience. I came to predict what his communication was going to look like, right? Interpersonal communication, communication between two people, is the process of reducing uncertainty. We communicate with other people to trust them and to get to know them better. For instance, a lot of people who use like dating apps, uh, things like Tinder, OkCupid, okay, right? People oftentimes We'll try to figure out information early on, figure out if that person is really who they say they are. You know, you feel like, is this somebody I can trust? Is this somebody who's not going to kidnap me? Right? That's information that we use early on to learn about. Information changes over time, right? We come to learn new things about somebody else. Uh, the information that we have about somebody changes, right? Sometimes there's somebody who we think seems totally fine um, and is great, but we see them like completely use, lose their temper. And suddenly we become really anxious about them, right? So we gain new information. And what this theory suggests is that it's possible to predict the ways in which we reduce uncertainty, right? That there is a method to which we as humans come to feel more comfortable and understanding towards one another. And that we can basically um, kind of map out what that process looks like. So there's a few different reasons why we should care about this theory, right? So what? Um, well, this theory explains why it is that we communicate. If we're talking and getting to know somebody, uh, if we're doing that to reduce uncertainty. If we're expressing greater comfort and trust with somebody, that's because we've done that process. It helps us to understand why we feel anxiety in a lot of our social relationships. In a lot of your classes, we do an icebreaker or an activity that's designed to build comfort and trust between people. Right, we might do a team activity. For example, it's been increasingly common for a lot of companies and groups to do things like escape rooms, right, where you have to solve puzzles uh, to get out of the room in a set period of time. And that's a way that people reduce anxiety and feel more comfortable too. And um, URT helps us to understand how we build comfort. So this is useful in an organizational setting. If you're working in a team and you're looking to build better relationships within that team, it's useful if you're thinking about your own relationship. Why do I feel comfortable with this person and not this person? How can I feel more comfortable and close with the people in our lives, right? Communication, tools for living. Um, so I think it's useful for us to look at some elements of this theory. This theory uh, comes from two communication scholars, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Charles Berger and Dr. Um, Richard Calabrese, um, who are both concerned with the ways in which we manage anxieties as they are related to communication. You'll notice that some of uh, these folks um, that bring in these theories are people that come directly from communication studies. Sometimes they come from other fields like psychology or cultural studies, right? Um, in any case, um, they're not the people that are the end-all be-all of the theory, but they're the ones who kind of got the ball rolling so that people could continue to explore, develop, and understand these theories a bit more. 
So your chi has a few different concepts here that are useful as well. Um, one of them is the idea that we are implicit researchers, right? We make sense of our conversations and interactions that we have with other people, right? In other words, through the process of communication, we're studying, understanding, and learning more about the people around us, both in terms of what they say, but also in terms of uh, the environment and interactions that we deal with them, right? Um, I watch a lot of trash and reality TV shows like The Bachelor. Um, I started watching this like weird one on Netflix that's like a Love Island, like adjacent show, right? A lot of the types of reality shows that are based on dating and relationships, of course, are not very authentic, uh, but uh, a lot of those shows are about understanding like who connects with who, um, how chemistry is formed between people. You know, we see that a lot in film, we see that a lot in like television, things like romantic comedies. Um, so we see a lot of how people form that closeness with each other, right, and reduce uncertainty. We also predict and forecast possible communication options, right? So in other words, um, one of the benefits to uncertainty reduction theory is that we get to predict what it is that we're going to say to something, right? So for instance, maybe we're talking and getting to know another, another student. We know that they have uh, a big soccer competition coming up that weekend, right? They've got a big game. Awesome. Cool. Maybe the next time you talk to them, you ask them how the game went. And that's an opportunity for you to feel more comfortable with that person because you know what to talk about. We explain and make sense of our interactions. In other words, as humans, we like to communicate about what happened. I just had this like really weird chat with somebody. Um, I didn't really know them, but they started asking me really weird questions about my personal life, right? So oftentimes we are um, putting the um, information we learn from our encounters into a mental library. And uncertainty is when there is a whole range of outcomes, right? If you are going to walk into your first day of school or your first day with the philosophy class, right? You know that it can play out a whole bunch of different ways. You have no idea what to expect, who's going to be there, who you're going to connect with, how much you're going to have to talk, right? You might step into a new class and have no idea what the first day is going to be like, but as the class continues, you start to understand. Um, some of the things that you do in the class, you start to understand like other students, what the instructor is expecting, you come to feel more comfortable, right? Um, so when we narrow down our possibilities, of what could happen in our interactions, we experience reduced uncertainty. Uncertainty, right, can relate to how we express ourselves verbally, right? We're not going to tell our life story and talk about like, an ex who dated for six years um, through the use of uh, casual conversation, right? Generally speaking, the level of what we share is going to be based on our comfort with that person. Nonverbal warmth is another factor, right? With people close to us, we might express through touch, giving somebody a hug, giving somebody a high five. Um, we might also use proximity. We tend to stand or sit closer to people that we're more comfortable with. We tend to have greater distance with people that we feel less comfortable. Self-disclosure, right? How much do we choose to disclose and share about ourselves? We're going to be looking at another theory just a little bit in the class um, known as social penetration theory. You might be familiar. It deals with the idea that like layers of an onion, over time, we start to peel back and share things more core to ourselves. Um, our reciprocity, right? Reciprocity deals with the idea that um, we are getting back what we are giving. In other words, um, you're sharing information about your life and somebody else is sharing information about theirs. So how much disclosure is happening on both ends? Maybe you're sharing a lot, but you don't really know much about the other person. Similarity is important too. How much do you have in common with somebody? Maybe you realize that, wow, they went to, you both went to the same high school, but you never had the chance to talk to each other, right? Um, that can be a way that we start to realize and develop conversation just on the basis of similarity. And then liking, right? Liking deals with the idea that, there are things that you find that you appreciate, whether it's platonic, romantic, somewhere in between, right? Maybe you find the person physically attractive. Maybe somebody is charismatic. They have a great personality. They ask really good questions. They seem interested in you. Um, those are things that relate to our uncertainty. In other words, right, um, I mentioned that this is a more positivistic and empirical theory, right? It is developing uh, a more quantifiable and measurable way of understanding how it is that we experience and deal with uncertainty in our lives. In other words, uh, this theory establishes what are known as axioms or laws 
to help us to explain how we experience uncertainty in our communication. So here's the first axiom. This is pretty basic, right? As we communicate more verbally, we experience less uncertainty, right? Over the course of your conversation, a little bit earlier today, um, as you shared more, you understood your names, you understood some things about yourself, you probably felt more comfortable. You started to get a picture of what this other person is. Okay, so this person loves to play music. Um, you know, they're also on the softball team. Okay, I think I know a little bit about them, right? So over time, as we communicate more, we feel less uncertainty around the other person, right? So think about it almost like a, you know, a cause-effect relationship or almost like a line graph, right, where... Um, Verbal communication is directly correlating to reduction and uncertainty. Axiom number two, as we express ourselves through nonverbal affiliation, our uncertainty also decreases, right? In other words, um, we express ourselves nonverbally more and we express ourselves more nonverbally when we have less uncertainty, right? As I mentioned, nonverbal communication is huge. It can be up to 90% of the way that we communicate, and we're more likely to trust our nonverbal communication. Somebody says, it's great to see you, but they're rolling their eyes and they sound sarcastic in their tone of voice. We're more likely to trust their nonverbal communication. They are not happy to see us, even though verbally they said that they are, right? So nonverbal communication is crucial. We can say so much just through our eyes, our facial expressions, our gestures, our tone of voice, right? Tone of voice and sound uh, is considered nonverbal. What you say through language and symbols is verbal, but how you say it is what's considered to be nonverbal, right? So um, as we feel more comfortable with people, we tend to do more nonverbal communication. We gesture more, we open up more, we um, are closer to that person. We might touch or tap somebody on the shoulder, right? Um, so generally speaking, um, we are expressing ourselves more nonverbally, right? If you are in something like an interview or you're having a first meeting, right? You're sitting down in class, right? You're like in your seat. Um, you're not really expressing yourself a whole lot. You might not even move your hands really. But as you feel more comfortable, you might start to open up physically more. And so we use that as a way of experiencing openness. As we express ourselves physically more, um, the other person learns more about us um, and that produces uncertainty. Number three, this is a pretty straightforward one, right? Um, say you're going to go on a date with somebody, right? There's a good chance that before you go on a date with somebody that maybe you've been talking to on the internet, maybe you slid into their DMs, right? You've taken some time to look them up online. Maybe you found um, their social media handle. Um, maybe, you know, they have a TikTok, Facebook, um, Instagram, et cetera. Um, you know, maybe you've uh, been kind of cheeky and liked one of their photos or two, right? You are doing things to try to understand a little bit more about the other person. In other words, um, when you're feeling really anxious, you are seeking out information, you're doing a search, and so on. Um, one area this is really common in is employment, right? If you are, um, if you've submitted an application and a hiring manager or committee is looking at you for a job, there's a good chance they're going to look up your social media um, and do like a Google search with you, right? In other words, um, as we know somebody better, we're less inclined to do that. We've already talked to them, we've worked with them face to face. Um, we don't really have information that we want to find about them online that we don't already know or we don't access through our communication, right? That's why in a TV show like Tactics, which examines how people um, seek out information in cases in which, um, you know, there's um, uncertainty as to whether or not they are who they say they are online. Um, there's a lot of information seeking behavior. Who is this person? Where do they live? What the heck is going on? Number four, um, when we feel a lot of uncertainty, we feel less intimacy in uh, uh, communication, right? In other words, um, if we feel very confident with people, we feel more intimate with them. That's pretty straightforward, right? Um, intimacy does not necessarily need to be romantic, but if we really understand and trust somebody, they're like a best friend or close family member, right? Um, generally speaking, our communication with them is going to feel a lot more meaningful and impactful. So um, the reciprocity axiom is a good one to think about here. Um, early on in the conversation with somebody, if you're just getting to know them, generally speaking, you have a back and forth, like it's very one-to-one. -one. 
how are you doing? Oh, I'm good. How are you? How was your week? Oh, it's okay. How was your week? Right? Like it's, it feels like it's very 50, 50 and that you're kind of going back and forth between the two people. But one of the hallmarks of a really good and close relationship is that it's not always that way. You have a lot of conversations and relationships that are very, very lopsided. In other words, uh, maybe you have a close friend or roommate, you go in and they just like vent for an hour about their day and about, you know, all the frustrations that they're dealing with. Um, you know, they their car broke down, their dog got lost, you're there to listen to them, right? Um, when we feel closer to people, we're more comfortable having less reciprocal interactions. We're more able to listen to somebody tell a story, be more uh, one-sided in their communication in that moment. We know that they could do the same for us. Another axiom is the birth of a feather. Right? It's the idea here that when we feel similarities between people, we reduce uncertainty. But if we feel that there are differences and dissimilarities between people, we feel a lot of uncertainty. Oh, wow. I've never been in that part of the state. I had no idea about it. Right? Can you tell me more? So we're seeking out information to deal with a big difference that we might have from somebody else. Similarities are an easy way, they're like social manic, right? They're an easy way to make our relationships just flow a lot more smoothly and connect better because you instantly have something to talk about. When we don't know people very well, we tend to like them less. When we know people well, we tend to like them more, right? Um, this is why we see a lot of relationships that develop like in professional and work settings, right? Um, so, for example, if you watch The Office, if you've seen like the relationship between Jim and Pam, right, a lot of characters who might not originally like each other that much just do by virtue of seeing each other all the time, right? You could call it, um, you know, Stockholm Syndrome, but for relationships. We like people because um, we spend more time with them, we know them better, even if they're not people we would have actively sought outside of the situation that placed us in that relationship. So there are a few conditions that impact how we seek out information, right? Um, so if somebody can reward or punish us, we tend to be more likely to disclose and share. We might be cautious, right? We're not going to share personal details that we feel like might reflect poorly on us in a job interview. So we consider the impact of our disclosure and efforts to reduce uncertainty. If a person behaves contrary to our expectations, for example, we think that they're a very nice person, right? But they like screamed and got angry in a way we did not predict, that can cause us to draw back and experience higher uncertainty. And another issue of observing future interactions, right? Um, you probably experienced road rage at some point in your life. Somebody honks, they flip you off because of how things are going. Maybe they're thinking you're driving too slow or tailgating you, right? Um, oftentimes, people get away with it, right? And they do road rage because they know they're not going to interact with that person again. But if you were like yelling and flipping somebody off on a way to a job interview, you discovered that the driver that you were harassing was the person that is interviewing you, you feel a lot more uncomfortable, right? So oftentimes um, we are more inclined to reduce uncertainty and to communicate more if we know that we're going to run into somebody again. When reducing uncertainty, we can be a passive person who's just an unobtrusive, like kind of paying attention to the other conversations happening in the class. Uh, we could be active, right? Trying to understand meaning. Perhaps we're looking up and researching information about the person that we want to learn more about. And then interactive is directly communicating, talking to the person as a way of getting to know them better, right? Humans, um, you know, we think about observational learning as a way that we can get to know each other and understand each other better. So, uncertainty reduction theory has some critiques. One of them is the goal of Communication is not necessarily about reducing uncertainty, which this theory suggests that it is. We communicate for a whole host of reasons. For instance, um, we communicate in an effort to better understand um, the experiences of people, even if they're very different than us. Sometimes we might be more motivated by wanting knowledge um, rather than lacking knowledge. In other words, we want to learn about people that we don't know very well. We're attracted to what's new and what's novel, right? And on that basis, we might choose to disclose and share more. And in the same way, if one of those axioms that we went over is incorrect, then generally, like kind of like a house of cards, it all kind of falls apart, right? Um, if we assume that people are more likely to communicate with people that they know worse, right? They're more uncertain about, well, that kind of 
really throws a wrench at the theory, right? So the theory really assumes that we communicate more with people we trust and people we respect, and doesn't really concern itself with the novelty of forming new relationships and the excitement that might come with that, that we do experience at a lot of early stages of relationships too. So um, an application here is the television show Catfish, right? It was based off of a film um, and essentially involved these two who go around and um, learn a little bit about people who have been dating or talking to people online. Um, and there's a lot of concern is the person who they say they are. Um, and Catfish is a great example here of how people reduce uncertainty through communication. Right? They try to get to know and meet the person face to face to confirm that they are who they say they are online. Right, So the purpose of the show is very much, I mean, obviously it's got the drama, shock factor, reality TV thing, but it also has um, you know, an effort to try to understand and confirm the information that we receive about each other. I wanted to share a clip from this that I think does a good job of uh, helping us to understand some of these elements of URT in action. Hi, Dee. I need help in meeting my fiance, Steven. Right. I need help in meeting my fiance. Yeah. My name is Lord. I met the love of my life online eight years ago and have yet to meet him face to face. Eight years ago. He is literally like the perfect. We haven't been able to find him or news about him anywhere. He isn't. So we said it doesn't be a bit of a But I feel like we're definitely getting closer. Whoa. Yeah. What else have you done? I gave you my bank information. What? Yeah. Have you ever been to Santa Money? Yeah. How long? Oh, that was amazing. Jesus, man. How do you plan about everything? He's always fun. I'm in Derek's driveway. Damn, what would be living? Like, really, 10 bucks. You don't think this girl has been using me? I don't think so. Wow, he had this curveball. I'm not going to sleep well tonight. I have a lot to say. Yeah, I want to see for myself what the truth is. So, you know, very, very high drama, high stakes, reality TV stuff. But um, a good example here, right? People sharing like, oh, you know, I, I gave them like a couple thousand dollars. There's oftentimes the thing about, oh, well, I want to see you. I want to fly to see you, but I need a plane ticket. Uh-oh, my plane didn't actually land and I don't have any contacts with you anymore, right? There's a lot of scams that you see on the internet, of course. Um, so this effort to say, you know, I want to know what's really going on. I want to know who this person is. Um, is this the person who they say they are? Well, that's that process of uncertainty reduction. Let's go and meet them. Let's go and go to where they are. Um, you know, this person says that they're into making music, but we don't see any of their music available online. Um, so what is true? What's not true? Um, so that can be a challenge, right, of that process of reducing uncertainty um, and dealing with those challenges. We have seen that even further confounded with, um, you know, the role of AI, right? So, for instance, you might be familiar with uh, the idea of like a deep fake, where people will do like these very, very realistic um, AI videos, where they will um, like use somebody's physicality and facial expressions. Um, there's like memes going around where it's like using AI in order to simulate voices, right? A lot of famous uh, figures, right? So they're, um, you know, I'm a nerd. I do a lot of video game stuff. There's been a lot of like YouTube videos where there'll be like AI voices of like Obama, Trump, and Biden, right? Who are like doing like cheer lists and stuff. That's become really popular. So there's like a lot of weird stuff where AI, um, you know, false profiles and all of that is circulating online. So we definitely, whether we're engaging face to face or whether we're engaging through media, feel an increasing urge to try to reduce that anxiety that we experience in our relationships. Because we're uh, just about out of time, uh, we'll just stick it to that part one of uh, attendance, but I will ask that you continue to think about some of these axioms and you can use them 
um, in your own um, reflection, if you choose to do a reflection on this theory. We took some time today to talk about URT, um, helping us to understand why we choose to communicate with other people, the various axioms and approaches that we use to reduce uncertainty, and some of the concerns surrounding motivation, right? This theory doesn't get at some of the reasons why we might choose to initiate conversations. Next class, we're looking at social exchange theory. So that'll get at some of our social relationships even further. Enjoy the snow, sleet, whatever is happening in the grand spring. Um, please pass forward or email your attendance activity for the day. Have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you again on Friday. Thank you. Thanks.